So welcome to our live Power 10 Q&A. Uh, we are really excited to have you join us today. If you're new to our webinars, welcome. Uh, if you are returning, welcome back. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Heather Dinho. I am part of the marketing team here at Service Express. If you have any questions about the event, the recordings, um, which should be to you by tomorrow, the latest, uh, any future events, please feel free to uh, send me an email. We will make sure to get my email in the chat. Um, so this is a great day to be talking about Power 10. Uh, in fact, we have people joining us from all over the world. Uh, so if you're joining us today, please feel free, put in the chat, let's see where you're coming from. Uh, I know just alone from those of us that are working on the webinar this morning, we've got some of us here uh, in Danbury, Connecticut, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, um, New Hampshire, Canada. So we really are uh, a global event today and we are really excited to have you join us. Uh, let's see if anyone is sharing where they're from. Does not look like it. We got a shy audience. Oh, let's see. We've got Grand Rapids, Michigan, Columbus. Uh, all right. Well, so we're going to kick off with a few items today. Uh, the recording. The recording of the session will be available for you no later than tomorrow. Uh, and with that as well, any charts that we do share, we will make sure to get those emailed over to you. Uh, if you have any questions during this session today, there is uh, a panel right in the GoToWebinar place, so please feel free to put your questions there. If you did submit any questions in advance, please know we have those, um, and Lori will actually be kicking off our session with those today. Uh, so, introductions. I would like to bring on our team of panelists and our moderator. So, our moderator this morning is Lori LeBlanc, who is an infrastructure sales consultant uh, from here at Service Express with the IBM side of the business. We have Pete Masiello, the uh, first ever lifetime power IBM champion. And we have Steve Pitcher, who is another one of our IBM power champions since 2011. So with that, Lori, I'm gonna kick it off to you. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. We haven't done this in a while. And um, I do have those pre-submitted questions. I want to encourage you to send questions to us in the questions panel because I will watch those and we will answer those questions. If we can't answer your questions, we'll answer them after the event, so do submit them. So my first question for Pete. I'm going to go with a question for Pete. We're talking about Power 10. So we're gonna go with an easy softball. What are the benefits of moving to Power 10? Good morning, Laurie, thank you. Um, boy, it's uh, it's been quite some time since we did one of these and it's, it's good to get back in the saddle. Um, you know, it's for those who've been iTech fans for so long, it's the same group of people. We just have different color shirts. We lost those sexy red shirts and now we have these blue shirts. So same team. Um, so what are the benefits of moving power 10? You, you know, obviously you get performance. Um, and you know, we're talking about 40% in performance improvement just on, uh, the machine itself. I, I think the biggest thing though, is probably NVMe, the availability that basically there are no spinning drives anymore and you're getting NVMe. NVMe stands for non-volatile memory express. It is like solid state instead of a disc. And, um, they're fast, they're much cheaper than SSDs, they actually perform better than SSDs, and um, you're gonna get some amazing performance out of it. All the machines we've installed so far, people have been just ecstatic at the performance they get. Now, there's some other things inside the NVMe chip, um, inside the Power 10 chip, uh, some of the Zlib things that will give you a little better performance on backups and, and save restores and stuff like that, um, but you know, if I had to say what's the best thing about Power 10, um, I'm, I'm going to say MVME. Okay. So let me give Steve and maybe a softball question. When moving from Power 9 to Power 10, is it advisable to apply PTFs on the new machine and do a backup option 21? I think you mean on the old machine. I would. No, it says on the new machine. Oh, okay. E either way you look at it, I think my answer will satisfy that. 
I think okay. it's a good idea to put PTFs on a machine, no matter what release you're on, and do a regular save 21, no matter what release you're on as well. So in terms of, as part of the migration, yeah, you need to perm apply your PTFs and you need to save 21 uh, beforehand. That's that's just the, the right way to do it, the best way to do it, and the only way to do it. Um, post getting there, there really shouldn't be too much of a need unless, you know, you're, you're back a little ways. If all you're looking to do is move from hardware to hardware and don't upset the apple cart, don't introduce any new features and functions, and your existing PTF level will support the power 10, and that's what you want to be on, perm apply your PTFs, back up your system, recover to the new system, have a little settling in period, wait a month or two. And then make uh, you know get back into the uh, the swing of things of of getting your system patched with um, newer PTFs, but as well just because you've you know just done a save 21 before you know your um, your migration two months prior, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do another one. Nobody ever got fired for taking too many save 21s, at least as far as I'm aware of. <laughs> but they might have if they didn't do enough. Well, if you kicked one off at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon on Black Friday, then uh, you probably got a stern talking to. You, you never know, but yeah, uh, I hear you. For, for all intents and purposes, you know, getting one at a reasonable time if you can afford the downtime, then absolutely. Um, Pete, here's the question. What are your thoughts on moving to a power 10 from a power nine or moving into the cloud? So, so it is, are you asking com compare and contrast moving yes. between? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, everybody's story is going to be different. So I don't think you can answer that generally. Um, you know, the, the larger the machine, I'm going to say probably the better chance that on-prem is probably going to be cheaper just because of your licensing and stuff like that from the configurations we've done in the past. Um, you know, there's certainly no disadvantage to going to the cloud. Um, there's certainly no advantages, you know, in either case. You got to look at each one individually. Um, you know, certainly, Moving from power nine to a power 10 is, is a great move. Um, you know, you, you're going to be able to have a couple of more operating system releases that would be supported on a power 10 versus a power nine. We talked about performance before. Um, I think what I would say is, you know, all power 10s are created equal, but not all clouds are created equal. So, you know, figure out who you're getting involved with, um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say are they reputable because that doesn't sound right, but um, really, are they a reputable company? Um, you know, how long have they been running a cloud? Um, ask to talk to some clients that have um, that that have been running, not just you know they've been running a month or two. You know, you want some long-term customers. You want to know what their you know how do they how do they replace hardware when do they replace hardware you know what do they have are they are they running power sevens um and that's going to give you a problem going to seven five you know so these are the kind of questions you have and and you know we've done a couple of moving to the cloud presentations um in the past and and you know maybe we'll we'll key that up for another webinar because i think this is about a 45 minute answer to compare and contrast moving to the cloud So here's a question to to tack on to that, and then I have another question to give you from about power. So I'll give this to Steve. It says, isn't going to the cloud still mean moving to a new power system just hosted by someone else? Sure, if you want to be reductive about it, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, I've, I've made that comparison myself. You're running it on a power system machine somewhere. Okay, so, but it also, you're also paying for other things, just not for the power. You're paying for, you know, you're, you're covering off the electricity. 
you're covering off the internet, you're covering off the switches, the firewalls. Um, you're paying for the privilege of somebody else to absorb those costs and the overall management and oversight of the iron. So yes, it means that you're putting it there, but it, with an overly simplistic uh, description of what cloud is, you know, I can go the corollary of that and people think, okay, I'm just going to put in the cloud and everything's hunky-dory. I don't have to worry about it. Um, that's not always the case. It depends on a lot of things. And as Pete just said, not all clouds are created equal. Do you have HA in your cloud? Are you paying for HA in your cloud? Do they test the HA in the cloud? Uh, what type of storage is there? Is it, you know, just a, you know, uh, you could say, I want to run a, a workload on a Power 5 in the cloud. Okay, that's great. It's still a power five in the cloud. Um, it's not getting PTFs. It's not getting OS upgrades. It's not getting much of anything other than some, you know, every now and then you have to replace a disk controller or a drive or something like that. So when you put it into a more modern cloud, you have more capabilities available to you. And I, you know, I, I'd be, I would be aware of a very simplistic uh reductionary description of what cloud is because on either side of the coin whether you're pro or against um you need to look at all the facts of the matter because they're they're entirely two different things somebody owns the responsibility of a number of different things regarding that power system machine whether you have it in-house or outside of the house right yeah. yeah and you know just to add one little thing on that because um, when Steve was talking about that, I thought, oh, yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, don't forget, not all cloud providers are the same. Some cloud providers are Intel cloud providers, and they have an IBM I off to the side, right? Be careful if that's what you're looking at, because um, they may not be able to spell IBM I. Um, and, and that's a problem if that's who you're relying on for your critical business computing needs. Okay. Pete, for those of us who have always used internal drives, what are the differences in configuring NVMe on Power 10? Okay. So um so I think and I think that came from Paul. Uh, I, I think when he means internal drives, I think he means internal spinning drives because NVMe is still internal. Uh, it's internal to the, the the system. Now, one of the things that are really nice about NVMe is they can be addressed individually. So before, we used to sign the controller to the partition, and then all the disks attached to that controller came along with it. For NVMe, you have the actual NVMe device, and that can be assigned to different partitions. Um, so when you look at, let's say, the NVMe expansion, well, let's not even go with an expansion. Let's just go with a standard um, NVMe um uh nvme device and if if we if we have a backplane and on a backplane you can put eight nvme adapters or eight vme u.2 um modules into it you literally can assign those to individual partitions now we have to mirror nvme because it needs some kind of protection um so you really could have four different partitions on one backplane and you could actually put two backplanes in a small system so there's really you could put eight partitions each having 3.2 terabytes of mirrored storage on a simple 4u machine um, and that's eight different partitions running independently certainly that's a big advantage um, but when we talk about you know spinning internal drives these are just NVMe and they're also internal. There's also external NVMe, but that's kind of something different. So, you know, that's part of a SAN. So I, I just want to make sure when I said NVMe before, I was talking internal, although it could be external, but then that would be into a SAN. Okay. Steve, would you recommend backing up to virtual disks residing on the power tent? Temporarily, sure, why not? But um, there's a couple of things that you would need to 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 be considerate of. Uh, number one, if you're backing up and leaving it there, 
um, and that's not a full system save, mind you. I'm talking about if you want to back up a library and stick it on a, you know, on your local disks, sure, um, you can certainly do that. Um, however, you want to get everything that you back up off that machine. Um, if I'm reading that question or hearing that question correctly, um, feel free to clarify. But sure, you can back up locally. However, anything you back up really should be copied to tape. If you're talking about um, what I really like is when people do things like flash copy. Okay, they're all on the same disk chassis as your production machine. So you quiesce your system, you flash your disks, you now have a mirror image of your of your system. That is useless to you if it's not backed up to tape and that machine physically dies, that sand physically dies. So anything virtual, um, whether you're sending it to a, you know, a, a FTPing it to a virtual partition or guest LPAR hosted by your production LPAR, sure you can do it, you can also drive a car with your feet. Doesn't mean it's a great idea. Put it there temporarily. Make sure you get it off-site to tape off to a VTL, some sort of external media, uh, far, far away from your system. The further it is away, the easier it is to have a little bit of uh, peace when you're sleeping, and uh, you get that phone call in the middle of the night saying the the server room is on fire. Uh oh, that's not good. We keep our tapes right next to the server. What are you going to do? Whenever you back something up, make sure it's far away. How about what should what should we be concerned with moving from seven three to seven five? What issues have you seen, Mr. Masiello? Oh, you want it? All right. Yeah, uh, so I want to mention security right off the bat, and then Pete could take the rest of it. Okay. So there are some ciphers that are not in the default set at 7.4 and 7.5. Every, and I don't get called a lot, but every single time I've been called to say, hey, can you help me out because I just did an upgrade from 7.3 to whatever, or 7.4 to 7.5, or sorry, 7.2 to 7.4, or 7.3 to 7.4, 7.3 to 7.5, whatever it is, every single time in the last maybe year or two has been Cypher support. Um, doesn't mean that it's not supported, just means it's not in the default set. So you may have to go into the lick, enable those ciphers manually, and then add them into your uh, Q, um, SSL, CSL uh, system value. Otherwise, they're just not there. And I've seen EDI break more than, I don't know, 10 times in the last year because of those things. So much that I, I ended up building myself a little online matrix to show what's not there so I can see very quickly what's not gonna work on the next one. So when we do upgrades now, we're very, very precise in understanding, okay, we put a lick macro in place, we're tracking all the ciphers that are being used, all the protocols are being used. Now we cross-reference that with what's not gonna be there by default at 7.4 or 7.5, so there's no surprises. Now we can identify it and say immediately after the upgrade, we can either, we can either immediately after the upgrade reinstate those things or we can say these are not in the default set for a reason let's make this a little bit better what endpoints are connecting using those ciphers and let's upgrade those endpoints to make sure that they are able to negotiate at a higher level than what we're at before sorry to boss hog my way in there pete but no, that's, <laughs> that's the one thing i see and i see it often yeah yeah i mean the one thing i would correct that steve said is We've always been careful when we do upgrades, not just recently. <laughs> um, but, you know, going from 7.3 to 7.5, I mean, it, it's an easy upgrade. It's a big jump. Um, and, you know, upgrades are all about planning. If you've ever heard me speak about presentations on OS upgrades, it's planning, planning, planning. There is no such thing as, I got nothing to do this Saturday. Let's do an upgrade. Um, you know, if, if you're on 7.3, well, if you decide you're going to go to 7.4, okay, well, what if you're on a 7, if you're on a power 7, you're in problem. If you're on a power 8, you can't go to 7.5, right? Um, we're going to have to increase the license internal code space for each one. There's required PTFs. 
getting from 7.3 to 7.5. If you're skipping that release, you need to read the memo to users for 7.4 and 7.5 because there's going to be changes to each release and you want to be aware of what those are so you can address them. LAN console is only going to be available at ACS starting with 7.4. So you need to make sure you, you update your ACS. Your console is either going to be an ACS or it's going to be HMC at this point. Steve already talked about SSL. Um, net server printer shares or net server printer and file shares, SMB version 3 is the default. Um, also, we need to look at supported versions of Java 8, Java 11, Java 17. Right, That's what's going to be supported on 7.4 or 7.5, so we need to address that, and we need to be doing a work JVM job on 7.3 to make sure that we don't have um, any Java 7. Right, We need to make sure we're at Domino 10 and, and above Right, uh, via HCL. We need to make sure we're on WebSphere, um, WebSphere 8.5.5.16 for 7.4. WebSphere 9.0, I think it's 0.5 for um, 7.5. And then MQ, uh, we got issues on that. MQ, you're going to have to be at 9.007 and then 9.1 uh, on um, as well. Or on 7.5, you got to be at MQ 9.2. There's a PTF level. I can't remember what it is. Uh, and Or 9.3. So these are some of the things we go about checking prior to the upgrade. Um, you know, making sure we got the required PTFs on, making sure we have the latest resave so that when we install that lick and we're basically putting the lick down first um, during the upgrade process, we have the latest PTFs on there, one for speed of implementation. But if there was a problem, it's already been fixed and we're not going to have that problem. So those are some of my top things. Excellent. All right. What are the pros and cons for using a virtual HMC to manage Power 10 over traditional or, I guess, a physical HMC? I think the, the, the pro is it costs less. Um, the con, and this happened to me three times, I went into a customer and said, where's the console? And they had put it on a virtual HMC, and, of course, the, the VMware farm was managed by a, a group of other people, not the IBM I people, and they were like, well, what the hell is this thing? Uh, and they deleted it. Um, so it's kind of hard for them to get their hands on a physical HMC. Uh, preference wise, I always put a physical HMC in as my primary, and then I put a secondary um, as a virtual. But I've put in plenty of virtual um, HMCs. They, they work just as well. Laurie, we can't hear you. Sorry, we got a few questions around Kate. So I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. Um, we currently have a TS3100 tape libraries and a laser vault backup device. So what is the industry standard for, for physical tape backups now? We only use the laser vault to a 10th or less. The veterans would rather have the physical tape in hand, I guess, because it's tangible. Are there single tape drive options available or is it all libraries now? Well, um, no, you can still get tape drives. You can still get tape libraries. You can get virtual tape libraries of all shapes and sizes from a number of different vendors. Um, where you're at physical tape and and maybe maybe I'll talk a little bit of physical tape and uh Pete can go with the uh the the VTL options a little bit there because he uh he he knows the other ones I I know cybernetics fairly well but I don't know the Falcon store stuff as well as I probably should um I would argue that historically I've been a bit of a tape bigot um I like a physical tape drive I like a physical tape library I like offline media because it's not electrical you know, you can't burn it. You can't magnetize it, so it's wiped. Um, you know, it, it's it's just there. And if you need to recover from LTO, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, LTO one was rated to last for 36 years. God knows what it is right now. 
uh, it will sit on a shelf and you can read it if you've got a drive that can read it. So there is value in physical tape. Um, I'm still a big fan of it. That doesn't mean that virtual is not there. You just need to ensure that when you have a virtual tape setup, you have to also make sure that you have a redundant virtual tape setup. Because if your server dies and your VTL locally is dead, okay, too bad. Um, what are you going to recover from? So having one of those replicate to another VTL off-site uh, to another building, another VTL, a VTL in a cloud, that's all well and good. At least you have it off-site and you can recover your business to that cloud or to a hot site when you get a replacement power systems machine. Let's say you're an on-premises customer. Um, yeah, you have a VTL that you can plug into that new power systems machine because it's not on fire or it's not burned. Um, and you can recover your system from it. So there's some real value there. Okay, um, so I, I think the biggest benefit, whether it's physical tape or virtual tape, is what's called the air gap, right? Um, that's that's what everybody's dealing with right now. You know, if if you get a ransomware, if somebody puts something on your system and you back it up, or the ransomware comes alive, right, and starts encrypting things, what do you do? You got to go to your backup, right? Now. Somebody's had a question before about writing to virtual tapes. Well, if you write to a virtual tape and you left it on your system, um, then that virtual tape could also get attacked by that virus. Um, so that's a problem right there. That's why it's, it's called an air gap, because literally there's, you'd have to jump from one machine to another, which viruses just can't do. Um, and, and that's the benefit of physical and virtual. Now, I like virtual. I like physical tape, like Steve does. Um, I'm also a big fan of virtual tapes because I think um, I, I want to get out of the, the handling of tapes. I want to get out of putting a tape in a box and sending it to Iron Mountain. And what does that cost every month, right? And then someone picking it up. And then when I want to recover the tapes at Iron Mountain, I got to call them. They got to bring it back. Um, Iron Mountain's a great place, right? But you got to think about that process. Um, you know, we all had a disaster if a hurricane hit. Everybody's calling Iron Mountain all at once to get their tapes back. How quick is that going to happen, right? So, so there's things to think about with physical tapes, but logical, ta logical or virtual tapes, uh, we don't have that. Now, as Steve said, virtual tapes, you must, they're like legs. You got to have two of them. Um, if you only have one, don't work too well um, because you back up, and, and where's your virtual tape going to be? It's probably in the same rack as your power systems running IBM I, maybe, maybe right above it. So if if a bulldozer comes running through the warehouse and smashes into the computer room, it probably knocked the, the, the whole rack out, and you lost everything. You lost your system and your, 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 your physical tape or your virtual tape. That's why when we do a backup, we back it up, we take it out of the... the tape drive or tape library and put it off site, as Steve said. Um, and so virtual tapes, while they're great, if you only have one, not a good solution. My recommendation is to always have two. Now, let's say you can't afford two. Okay, well, there's cloud providers, Service Express, we have virtual tapes in the cloud. You can replicate your virtual tape to one of our virtual tapes, right? So there's multiple solutions out there for that. But I think virtual tapes, you know, are great. now. Steve had a good comment about that LTO-1. You can't put an LTO-1 on a Power 10 running 7.5. Um, 7.5 actually doesn't support LTO-1, although I, I bet you it would still work. It just not says, it says it's not supported. Um, so you have to have that means of either duplicating it on an older machine, finding your business partner who usually has a whole bunch of tape drives, and they can be able to dupe it for you. Um, you know, I say this all the time. Every single business partner buys the same hardware from IBM and resells it to you. It's the things they do around the IBM I that differentiate us from everybody else. And that's why, you know, you know, if your business partner doesn't have a tape drive that you can borrow to do the migration or to go back and read your old tapes, they're not, they're not invested. Okay. And, and, you know, maybe you want to find a business partner who's a little bit more invested in, and has those capabilities to help support you. Lori, I'm off the soapbox. Okay. Um, here's one. 
either one of you guys, you can maybe both take some of this. So we're moving to the power 10 and other than increased CPW, what are the main benefits in particular .NET slash IFS connection, IFS connections can we expect from the power 10? Well, you, you, I mean, I think that question is really more OS specific than it is for hardware specific because from an IFS, it's going to run the exact same way. Now, there's things that you could do on on any hardware, power seven, power eight, power nine, power 10, you could be doing link aggregation. So you increase your, your bandwidth to and from your switches by aggregating multiple lines together, getting better redundancy, improved performance. But I think the biggest thing is getting on the later version of SMB uh, because you're gonna see a big difference. We had a customer, um, they were running SMB one, it was taking 45 seconds to open this huge Excel spreadsheet. And you know they were opening the Excel sheet from their PC, but it was on a, a shared folder. Um, and we just took them to, I can't remember if we went to SMB2 or SMB3, but it went from 45 seconds to seven seconds. Um, so that really wasn't about the hardware. That was all about the the, the staying current with the OS and, and moving up. Yeah, it's a memory you, usually when you have memory, encrypted memory with the Power 10, which would be a, a new benefit, right? Does that make you happy, Steve? Encrypted well, yeah, memory. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. but I, I I think that you know given the example you know we, we were we were kind of talking about speeds and feeds and things and from a security perspective there's a ton of stuff at seven five which is fabulous and I'm hoping for one of those questions which I'm I'm not going to answer in case there is, um, but from a performance standpoint what that person is describing is a symptom of a problem that may or may not be anything to do with the IFS. It may be. It all depends. Are you still running SMB1, right? Do you have a 25-year-old line description that's still running at half duplex 50 meg or 10 meg, rather? I have no idea. Um, what you really need to be looking at is solving the underlying problem that may be satisfied with the OS upgrade, new SMB version, but you may have some other things in there. You know, we, we see every now and then somebody configuring a machine with one drive one like they get you know nvme adapters and they're like yeah we've got nvme it's gonna be fast and they have one lun and they're wondering why it performs like a pig it's because you have one lun and you kind of need five or six in order for it to do it any kind of justice so you want to look at the problem a little bit deeper other than okay we have an ifs speed issue where's that coming from is it only ifs is it coming from the outside is it all ifs traffic on the inside um, is it backing up your IFS? Do you have 50 million objects with excess private authorities in one directory? That's why your saved sec data is taking 20 hours. Um, IFS is very broad and performance, you know, I'm assuming they mean that server. Um, but then again, I don't know. I don't know. So you kind of got to look at it and peel back the onion a little ways until you find where it really starts to smell and then solve that. Here's a here's a good question. Does the Power 10 support SAN Pure Flash Array storage? Yes, but it only supports it with VIO. Uh, so you got to go VIOS, um, and um, you're going to do a little OEM config setup in that because uh, the the pure storage doesn't support the virtual fiber channel. So you're going to go vSCSI connecting to it, which means you're going to create the H disks. And then in VIOS, you match map those H disks to disks uh, in in each partition. So VIOS does a little bit more work, but yes, it's it supported. Uh, you have to get the, uh, there's a, 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 a driver basically that gets installed into uh, VIOS for pure storage. And, and we've, we've done that. Okay. And here's the VIOS question, which I think kind of ties into what we were just talking about, which is um, what about VIOS and what role would that play with a Power 10 implementation, if any? So, uh, Steve, I'll, I'll just take that, continue on it, unless you want to. 
Yeah. Okay. Definitely not. Um, you know me. <laughs> so you know VIOS. Uh, you know if you're running a single LPAR, um, and you're and you're connecting to external storage, you don't necessarily need VIOS. Or you don't need it at all. Um, now, if you're running four or five LPARs, yeah, it makes sense to go VIOS. Um, you could go IBMI hosting IBMI. Um, and, and if it's VIOS versus IBMI, um, you know, from the, the the hosting environment, VIO gives you more capability. Uh, you're using processors or that are not part of your IBMI license count. So there's some advantages there. It attaches to different uh, storage as well. But if you don't have any VIOS skills, some people are afraid to do that. So they shy away from VIOS for that. But remember, VIOS is not required. Uh, if I'm doing multiple LPARs, yeah, I like to put VIOS in. If I'm doing flash copy, I love putting VIOS in because then I can create um, my flash copy partitions. I can create my control partitions all without putting additional adapters in. So it's just like for those people who run VMware and you're doing virtualization, you're doing that same virtualization, you're virtualizing the fiber channel, you're virtualizing the ethernet. So you're reducing the number of physical IO adapters. Um, and of course, you just wanna make sure you give VIO the enough resources and don't starve VIO because it's the server that's doing all your, your IO to all your other partitions. Okay. Steve, will the IBM Power 10 support the Hash library S36 environment and the software that I plan to migrate to the Power 10 from the Power 8? Yes. Um, like there's no there's no removal of you know older library support you know historically from system 36. Um, can you still use a display file 36 object? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some people might have a pound sign whatever. It's just it's literally just a name on the library um, with a with a with a pound. Uh, prepending, and I suppose I do that a lot with journal receiver libraries. If I'm creating a you know a new library specifically for journal receivers, I do a pound pound journal lib or you know pound pound sec lib, something like that. Um, but is there you know any um, removal of support for older objects from you know heritage operating systems? No, not yet. <laughs> so. Lots of people we have submitted question about this. We've got online live question about this. So the TS31 tape library is going into support at the end of the year. What is my best replacement option that is similar in size and functionality? And can I obtain a war extended warranty from IBM? So you, so you can't uh, get an extended warranty for a TS3100. Um, we can certainly. Um, provide third-party maintenance on a TS3100. For a replacement, um, you know, if it's SAS, I would go with a TS2900 if you only needed nine tapes. If I needed more than that, or if I needed fiber, then I'd go to a 4300. 4300 could have multiple libraries or multiple well, multiple drives and multiple libraries inside um, the, the tape library itself. So the 4300 is a really good replacement. It also has dual power supplies, which I kind of like because um, there's my single point of failure and the 3100 is, is the one power supply. S same thing on the TS2900. The nice thing about both the 3100 and the 4300 is I can swap drives out. So if I had bought it with an LTO6 and then a couple of years later, I decided I want to go to LTO8 uh, if it's a TS3100 or 4300, I can just pull it out and replace the drive. If it's a TS2900, um, that's integrated and you, you can't replace that. Okay. Um, so speaking of BIOS, how often should you do BIOS upgrades and firmware upgrades? Is once a year enough or should you do it more often? I would say at least once a year is enough. Um, you don't usually have to go more than that. Um, is twice a year recommended? Yeah, probably would, wouldn't be a bad thing to do. But you know, part of that is downtime, especially with the firmware. Now, if you have your BIOS 
running correctly, you should have dual VIOS. Um, so you should be able to take one down and the other VIOS will, will handle all the IO. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do that during the middle of the day when we have a lot of IO work going on because you're going to put all that workload on one VIOS, uh, but you should be able to upgrade them interchangeably. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that's something that you want to test out. You just don't want to assume. Um, you know, I'd go to my SAN, I'd look at my SAN, I'd make sure I have four connections um, because each VIOS should have two fiber channel cards and each fiber channel card should go to a different switch. So if you have two switches, you'd, you'd set uh, fiber card one, port one to go to switch A, uh, fiber card one, port B to go to switch uh, two. Uh, and then you'd have each switch would go to each container on the SAN. So you'd have multiple paths. Um, and before I would drop a VIOS, I would make sure that I had all my paths by going to the SAN and looking at the host connections and making sure they were all up um, or, you know, maybe test dropping one of the VIOSes at a, at a, uh, a, a maintenance window um, so that if, if it does come down, you know, you, you know it at that point. But, you know, when we, when we build them, we always build them with a redundancy in. That's the way IBM recommends it. Um, you know, four adapter cards, two in each, and you should do the same thing with your uh, Ethernet adapters and, and, and build it that way. So you have the redundancy in there as well. And, oh, and, and then firmware, we should, I, I, uh, firmware, I'm always every, at least every nine months, and you'll never have a problem. If you wait too long, sometimes you have to update the HMC before you can update the firmware. Sometimes you have to update the HMC a little, then update the firmware, then update the HMC again, then update the firmware again, because you've waited too long. And the compatibility between the HMC and the system firmware um, is, is only so compatible and you got to look at the matrix for each machine to see what's when it's compatible and not okay steve when dealing with the auditors i occasionally get hit with the what antivirus are you running have the power 10 or b75 address this in a more formal way no um it does not However, uh, in terms of antiviral support, you have a number of options, and I shouldn't say no in reality. Um, when it comes to antivirus or anti-malware support, there are a number of different software vendors that produce um, fairly polished pieces of kit that will protect your IBMI. Um, by way of exit point programs okay and um you know we're we're fairly partial to um fortress power tech antivirus um they've gone through a couple of renamings and rebranding so forgive me if i don't have that correct if there's anybody from fortra on the call uh, but it does work very well and what i do like about that product is that they did roll in they've had you know the old standard antivirus from biteware they purchased that years ago when they absorbed biteware and um, anybody who is currently a antivirus customer gets enablement to use their anti-ransomware components that they put into the product, what, a year and a half ago, give or take. Uh, so that's a nice little value add there. And, you know, any any type of product is going to work a very similar way. It's an exit point on your file server. So your net server exit points uh, for your file open, file close events, your file server exit point itself. And it's going to look for behavior. So from an antiviral perspective, it has a number of different virus definitions. It looks for as it scans objects, either as they're open, closed, or on a nightly scan or a daily scan, whenever you go through your entire system. Um, the anti-ransomware, it's sort of similar. It uses, you know, similar concept that it uses an exit point to track behavior, but it's more or less object destruction or changes coming from the outside hitting your file server so yes you can buy products to do that now at 7.5 does it make it any easier to do that uh not really the the guts have been in there since what five three five four five four and um you can roll your own 
anti anti ransomware pro program if you want to. Uh, is it hard? No, I built one. I'm not a great programmer, um, but it works. It works pretty darn well. Uh, it's just one of these things that if you have the tools, you can build it. If you don't have the tools, you can buy it. And you're going to spend either time or money one way or the other. You're looking at it. But is there anything with 7.5 or Power 10? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's more or less taking advantage of the exit points that have been out there for the last, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 years and putting them to use either by buying a product to do it or rolling your own. Okay. So, so Steve, so, I got a, I, I got a question for you. Well, I, it's not a question. Uh, I want you to answer this to everybody. Um, yes, so we're talking about ransomware. We're talking about antivirus. And, you know, you and I both talk about this all the time. What's the problem that gets everybody caught with their pants down when it comes to the IFS? Oh, well, sharing too much and not protecting what you share. That's exactly So sharing that so damn root, right? Sharing that damn root, sharing just about anything that's important that you want to protect. Like if you experience a ransomware attack without any type of protection, you will lose data usually because we have a very big problem in our community, which is all object is given out like um, like Skittles. You know, you're just tossing them out easy peasy and uh, some you know I'm I'm, I, I'm working with a customer on a project right now and they're getting connected from the outside from Amazon web services through a particular port opened up through the firewall to their IBMI and they're testing with a copy of QSEC offer I'm like no no don't do that make it work inside the network first find the least amount of authority you need to do the task and continue with that just because when you move it outside the firewall, it doesn't work, doesn't mean you have to give, you have to give a QSEC offer um, or a QSEC offer equivalent. So if we stop giving out all object, you reduce your risk. If you stop sharing important things like your root directory, um, your risk goes down drastically. So if you don't have any net server requirement, any file sharing requirement on your IBMI, shut that thing off and don't share anything. There's your solution right then and there. You don't need to share anything, don't. Uh, and you will never have a ransomware attack. Knock on wood, exactly. there's another way to get in there. But you know, a service that isn't on cannot be exploited, period, full stop. That's the law. Okay, here's Perfect. an add-on question for that that somebody submitted. Does the third-party antivirus software really protect anything other than files in the IFS? I well, don't think I understand the grammar of the question, really. But Pete, if you got it, go ahead. I, I, I think he's asking is, is you know, is the antivirus really only protecting the IFS? Um, and if we think about the IFS and we think about root, what's under root? Basically everything, right? So the QSYS file system is under root. Um, DLOs are under root. And, and what we call the IFS file system is under the root as well. Um, so. You, you got a lot out there, but but the anti ransomware is just doing the IFS. It's it's not checking your DB2. Although somebody could corrupt something in DB2 because it's under the IFS with a share. Sure, people share stuff in the QSYS file system all the time. I don't know why, but it it, it happens. So. An object's an object's an object, right? So when you're viewing it from an SSH perspective or an FTP perspective or an SMB perspective, it's just an object. The fact that it's a library type object, you know, a star live object or a star pigum object, it doesn't matter. If the, you know, the rights are weak and the credentials you're using are strong, it's gone as long as it's not in use. So yeah, the IFS is the integrated file system. It's called that for a reason. There's roughly 10 file systems underneath that root. So if it does protect anything other than the IFS, no, it doesn't. It protects the entire IFS, the entire system, if you set it up to do that. Okay. Pete, here's a question. Um, how does the BMC authentication work and why is that important? Oof. Um, so uh, the BMC, so the BMC, now we have a BMC on the HMC. Um, and we have a BMC on the FSP, right, on the power tens. 
Um, they're both based on BMC. Um, the, the BMC is a separate port that you connect to on the HMC. You can give it an address. Now, you can also share the Ethernet, but I don't recommend that. I recommend putting it, giving it its own port um, versus you know, having it dedicated, basically, uh, versus sharing one of the other ones. Uh, but when you do that, that BMC gives you unbelievable access to your HMC, like starting consoles, doing anything that you do is if you were standing in front of it. You know when you upgrade your HMC, if you do it remotely and it goes blank, and then you kind of wait for about 45, 50 minutes, uh, and you don't know what's happening. It's like the dark side of the moon on P Apollo 11. You know, we had to wait for the damn thing to come back around the moon to get into communication. That's a problem because you just don't know what's going on. If you connect to the BMC and you configure that correctly, then you're all in, and you can actually see the upgrade as if you were standing in front of it. Why I like the HMC, why I like the BMC on the HMC. In addition to that, I can mount virtual volumes, kind of like the way Vios does it. I can mount virtual volumes and then do my upgrade right from the virtual volume. <laughs> it's it's slicker than you know what. Um, now the BMC on the on the power system needs to talk because they put the BMC in there for for a faster access. Um, so you need to configure the BMC on your Power 10. Um, and it really needs to be set up as a DHCP. Um, now, when you get your DHCP, you're going to get that specifically from the HMC. Um, it's going to give it to that address. And then that helps with the VMI and does the communications between the partitions and between the partitions and um, between the partitions and, and the flexible service processor. Okay. We have time for one or two more questions at the most. So, Steve. Yes. Okay. Why should I upgrade before December 31st, 2023? I heard there was a price increase coming. Um, can you help provide an example of how we could justify a purchase in 2023 versus 2024? Okay, um, so y there are a couple of things coming down the pike. And um, first, you have a January, uh, beginning of January price increase of 6% for software maintenance. And I do believe storage, okay, nothing in power and no power parts are included in that. Swam is 10%. Swam is 10%. Licenses are 6 your IBMI licenses, your LPPs, six. Mm -hmm. So sorry, it, go ahead. That's going to be more expensive for sure. The big one, well, not the not software maintenance is usually a bit more expensive than hardware. Um, but if you look at what's coming down the pike in, um, I think it's the end of March for Power 8. Um, Power 8 servers because they're gone uh, end of service at this point, uh, or they will be um, between the spring and the fall of 2024, depending on the model. And actually, I just had an article published by IT Jungle today, if I remember correctly, um, that kind of goes through some of this, where, you know, depending on the model, it's going to go end of service at a, a certain time. But let's talk about, say, the S814, most popular Power 8 that's out there that will get a and this is what ibm is saying there is no announcement letter for it they have given it to the partners to bring forth to the masses there's going to be a 70 percent price increase on power rate hardware maintenance um so if you're let's say let's pick an arbitrary number um let's just say you're paying 10 grand a year in power rate maintenance that's going to be 17 come the spring and that's going to be a service extension for your power eight with a service extension it's not the same maintenance agreement that you have currently. Okay, your response time guarantee will not be the same. It's going to be a little bit worse. Um, not drastically worse, but it's gonna be, um, you know, you're not guaranteed a two or four hour response time, whatever it is right now, once that thing goes into service. Um, so just be aware, you do have software maintenance, software increase price or software pricing increases coming in January and you have hardware maintenance increases coming in the spring and throughout the year for Power8. 
And that's, you know, I've cost justified a number of different fourth quarter opportunities right now that we're working on in order to get stuff shipped before the end of the year so that we can work on a Q1 install uh, before the power rate goes into service. That's the plan. It's not too late. Not too late. Pete, did you have a question you wanted to answer before yeah, I we? Yeah, I see a question. How many drives would you recommend? Um, so when we're, we're talking IBMI, um, we always want a minimum of six drives um, because when IBMI sees that there's six drives, it opens up the queue depth uh, and it allows a lot of th things, the allows IO to run a lot better, runs your saves and restores a lot better. So you can take an NVMe drive and let's say it's 3.6 terabytes and you can make it one drive. Um, not recommended, not a good idea, right? Because if you have you have two NVMEs, you mirror them. And if you made each one, let's say a 3.6 terabyte drive, you made each one um, a namespace of 3.6, you'd have two namespaces, which equate to two drives in your system. IBMI is not gonna push as much IO to it. But if you take those and then break them down, and let's say you say, I'm gonna make them 400 gigs each, well, then I'm gonna have eight NVMe namespaces on each NVMe adapter uh, or U.2, whichever. Um, now I'm gonna mirror those. So I'm gonna have 16 total drives. I'm gonna mirror them. I'll have eight physical drives or I'll have eight LUNs basically or eight namespaces. Then IBM I will look at that and say, I got a lot of IO, I got a lot of disks there. I can, I can really push IO to it because it allows for a deeper Q depth. So you, you and, and that's in any case, whether you have spinning drives, whether you have SSDs, whether you have VIOS, whether you have IBM I hosting IBM I, you always want a minimum of six. Okay. Heather? Are okay. we? I was waiting to see if we had one. Did you one more question? But um, so really over, over, overwhelmed by how many questions we got here today. We still have um, a bunch from the chat. Um, so I think we're going to go back. We're going to regroup and we are going to see about getting a part two on the calendar so we can make sure that we are answering all these questions you have uh, about Power 10 uh, definitely before the end of the year. So stay tuned. Um, on that topic, uh, we want you to save the date. Steve Pitcher will be coming back for a webinar next month, November 8th. He is going to be doing Power 8 and the support. What are my options and what does that mean? Uh, registration is not quite open yet, but as soon as that link does go live, you will be getting exclusive email with an invite to that webinar as well. Um, so thank you to our uh, presenters today, uh, Lori, Pete, and Steve. We appreciate having you on here. And to everyone for joining us today around the globe, uh, thank you for joining us and stay tuned. We've got a bunch more webinars planned. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Well, this is the most excited I've been in about six months. This is great. I'm glad we...